Welcome to the Success Journey Show. Let's travel together through the lives of individuals on the road to success. Hey, 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 what's going on, travelers? It's Ricky Venters and Marlon Bannon, and we're back with you for another episode, another week of the Success Journey Show. What's going on, Marlon? How you doing, man? Oh, man, oh, man. You know, it's another, another wonderful day near the Christmas. Well, when people hear it, it's going to be way after Christmas, but for us... It's, it's still going to be cold, cold, but it's still going to be cold. It'll still be cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. It is freezing, man. I, I just cannot... I do not like this time of the year. I can't wait to that time of the year. That Later in, in life, man, when this time of the year, spending in a nice, uh, warm, tropical weather, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, same temperature. Nice 70 degrees. You know, uh, yep. that'll be nice. That'll be nice, man. So I get up every day and grind, thinking about that, thinking about those mornings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you're in the when the sun, and then you've been wishing like, man, uh, I need a little cold in my life. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I miss the snow. I'm gonna yeah, go travel yeah. through the snow. Yeah, humans, yeah. humans are never happy, man. Humans are never ha- never happy. I know it. I know it, man. Yeah, I. Um, so what you been up to, man, this week? Uh, this week, so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't let nothing really get me down, man. Uh, so a couple, two weeks, two months ago, uh, my basement flooded twice in one week. Um, from all the, my sub pump, my sub pump went out. So I've been trying to get this thing done before Christmas. So the guy, the guy's downstairs and we're, we're, um, we're just getting the, 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 everything down. So my head, my house is chaotic right now and I hate being in the chaos. Everything is just everywhere. I'm just like. Uh, my my mind yeah. is going. So, yeah, what, that's what, that's man, it's looking good. Looking yeah. good. Yeah. Knocking it out. Nah, that's what's up. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, they um, chaos comes before beauty. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. In my office, man, it's like stuff everywhere. Yeah. Every day, I have everything in the background, you know, because I'm working. So I had to work out of the room sometimes, and you know, stuff all around you, and then you know, at night just getting down, getting work done. So yeah, definitely understand that aspect of it. <clears throat> yeah, I, I've been um I've been doing good, man. I, you know, we are getting closer to heading out to um, a baseball convention, top of the year, be my first, my first one. I know your first one as well. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Excited about, excited about that. And then also um, you know, just life, man. The kids are getting bigger and just really enjoying how they're growing my oldest son is hitting that 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 pu- puberty uh emotional joint that should be like this high emotion just be crying out of nowhere i'm just like dang man you know, it's, I, it's, I never had that emotion I'm, I'm just i'm just laughing like oh my goodness man what the I, never, world? <laughs> yeah, I never experienced that uh, uh that i remember i did man i remember i did i was like yo real I'm, Crying, yeah, it would be like, I remember at 13, something like that, is this crying, and I'm seeing myself crying, like, yo, why am I, why, I'm getting mad even more bad, like, yo, why am I crying about this? <laughs> yeah, I never, <laughs> you know, I never, I never just, oh, man, yeah, it's happening, so, now nah, I just enjoying just the, the cycle of life, man, as it goes to that, so, but yeah, guys, uh, really appreciate everyone that's tuning in with us today, we have another phenomenal guest that we're going to bring on in a minute, but just wanted to stop and just uh, say hello, uh, check in on you. You know, why don't you leave a, leave a note, give us a little check in on how you're doing in your life and uh, what's going on in your end of the world. Maybe you're in a place where it is sunny all year round and you want to send Marlon and I some tickets, you know, whatever it is, you know, um, be happy, we'll be happy to receive it. Great. Very gracious. Uh, uh, um, yeah, but uh, love, love you guys, you know, and know you're going to have a great time listening to this segment, this session today. So, all right, man, we're going to jump right into our guest for today. Hey, like we said, people, it's our favorite segment of the show is when we bring the, the 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 person on and we have today we have Paul Shapiro we have Paul Shapiro on and it's gonna be a great show because his the the the, the venture that he's on is something that Rick and I have dealt dived into so we're gonna have a lot of fun a 
Happy to have you on, Paul. How are you doing? Marlon, Ricky, great to be on with you guys. Thanks so much. Great to be talking with you. And to answer your question, I'm doing fine. You know, all these people around us getting Omicron, but they're saying they're not that sick. So I feel pretty good about it. Oh, man. Yeah, man, I tell you, man, that, that right there is a blessing in itself, right? Um, yeah, it is. Uh, so yeah. happy to have you on. It's, it's an honor to have you on and I'm talking with you today. Hey, it's hey, my Paul. honor. I'm glad to be on. Paul, why don't you go ahead for our travelers? We call our travelers because we believe that everybody's on a destination and we're on a destination with them. So for our travelers, just let them know who you are, what you're all about, and then we can jump into it. Yeah, sure, Marlon. So I'm somebody who has been concerned for a long time about how we're going to feed humanity into the future. Because right now, you know, the planet, it's just not getting any bigger, right? So we know that humanity's footprint on the planet is getting a lot bigger, but the planet itself isn't getting bigger. And one of the primary ways that we leave that footprint is through our food print, or principally the amount of meat that we eat. This takes a lot of land, a lot of water, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, and more to raise and slaughter all of these billions of animals for food. It takes a lot. And we don't have another planet. We don't have a, we're not going to be farming Mars. We're not going to be farming the moon. We have one celestial body to farm, and we're going to have billions more people coming onto the planet in the next 30 years. So if we're not going to deforest the rest of the planet, and yet people still want to eat meat, how can we do it? And so now, you know, we know that we can produce energy without fossil fuels. We can do it through solar, we can do it through wind, geothermal, and more. Well, the question is, can we, in the same way that we can make light without oil or without coal, we, can we make meat without animals? And that's what I've been trying to figure out for some time. So I wrote a book on the topic, it's called Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner and the World. And I also started a company called The Better Meat Co, which is committed to creating meat experiences that don't rely on animals. And so we use microbial fermentation to make foods that really look and taste like animal meat, but are much better for us with a much lighter footprint on the planet. Mm. Man, oh man. Hey, so I'm gonna tell you, Ricky, he's a he's he's a bad guy. You know why he's a bad guy? <laughs> I'm ready to hear it, Marlon. He was born a vegetarian. Yeah, I wasn't born a vegetarian. <laughs> well, no, well, no, well, your parents. Well, your parents. You, I was you, raised you, a vegetarian. You're raised a vegetarian. <laughs> you're raised a vegetarian. Or a pescetarian, okay. as they would say now, right? Okay, yeah. so then what happened bad? I'm, I'm ready to hear it, Ricky. You, you, you have uh, digressed here. What happened? Uh, no, so he, he says it's bad because I think at what, what, what point in your life? Probably like 20, um, 15, 20? Yeah, 20, about 1920, Marlon, I became a vegetarian. He became a vegetarian. Nice. And yeah. then, uh, somewhere along, so over, over the years, as we've known each other, you know, I started doing more and more meat consumption. And it started off with uh, getting chicken gravy on rice at a restaurant. Just and the gravy. You, just the yeah, gravy. Just the, yeah, and I said, just the gravy, man. I don't want anything else. The gravy. And he looked at me like, wait a minute, what are you doing? I thought we were, I thought you were doing this vegetarian. I said, I said yeah, yeah, just having some gravy, man. Is it chicken gravy? Just for the flavor, right? And uh, over the years, the last couple, last couple of years, you know, I started consuming, uh, you know, uh, chicken and turkey. Um, I've always had fish, but you no know, chicken and turkey. So now he looks at me like, man, I thought I, I try to be vegetarian like you, man. And now you turn the other way around. So that, that was his old thing. Um, yeah. so Ricky, by the end of this interview, Ricky, Marlon and I are going to get you back on our side. Okay. So yeah, there you, we go. Be, there there you go. better, better be ready. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So that was the surprise we had for you, Paul. I, I've been vegetarian for like, since I've been 1920. No, I have to confess. So what, what was that like six, seven years ago? What was <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> around three, around three years ago. Three. Sorry, yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, now 43. So um yeah, and I must confess that every about maybe not Christmas heavy, but on Thanksgiving, I'll have some of Ricky's turkey because he does make a good turkey. So I'll have I'll have a slice of turkey on Thanksgiving. I'll pay for it later. If you've been a vegetarian, you know what I'm talking about. I'll pay for it later. Yeah. But um, I, I'll, I'll have a slice of Ricky's turkey. All right. So first, now, now I'm seeing, Ricky, what a bad influence you are. But I'm going to say this. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this. Uh, several years ago, uh, somebody told me something nearly identical to what you just told me, Marlon. I was giving a speech, and a woman in the audience raised her hand. And she said, you know, I could be a vegetarian, except... I can't say no to my grandmother's Thanksgiving turkey. Like, I just have to eat it. I can't say no to her. And I said, 
then great, be a vegetarian 364 days a year and eat the turkey on Thanksgiving and then go back. That's fine. Like it's not black or white. You don't have to yeah. do all or nothing, right? You can yeah. do a lot. You know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. If you're going to say, hey, I'm a vegetarian 364 days a year, that's awesome. Pat yeah, yourself on the right. back. Don't, don't, don't beat yourself yeah. up. Yeah. So a- anyway, you know, look, some people, they want to go whole hog or maybe they want to go no hog, you know, and do nothing. They do no meat whatsoever. Uh, some people, they do like um, what this uh, one cookbook author named Mark Bittman does, where he uh, does, uh, he says vegan before six. So he's vegan before 6 p.m. And after 6 p.m., he eats whatever he wants. Um, mm-hmm. Or you can you, you can do what I do, which is vegan before 6 p.m. and vegan after 6 p.m. So the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> the whole day. Uh, but either way, you got a lot of options. And oh, you should, so, you know, you should do, do the best. Dude, we do the best we can. You know, that'd be uh, perfect. I, I love it. You know, I, I would tell you my next move is, I, I don't want to say vegan. I want to say vegan. I don't know if I can go straight there, but definitely getting back to a cleaner, uh, more whole food uh, diet, vegetarian diet, just because of what it make, make how it makes you feel. But what, what I want to ask you, Paul, is, you know, we have a lot of travelers, people from all over the world um, that are tuning in right now. And these names go all around, vegan, vegetarian, pescetarian, keto, all these different things. Um, but tell us a little bit more of, on, on, from your perspective or from your life, what brought you down this journey to be a vegan? Um, and, and how did you find it? Uh, and how have you sustained it to this point? Yeah, you know, Ricky, I grew up really liking animals a lot. And I uh, always had a passion for dogs, especially like my family had dogs. My mom worked at the local animal shelter. And so I just, uh, <laughs> oh, you gotta, oh, man, I had to, <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to interject there, man, because you were taking me somewhere. I said, you like animals. And I said, wait, okay. So he likes eating animals. And he said, I like dogs. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In that case, you would say like dog singular. I like dog. No, no, no. no. I like dog. <laughs> no I'm sorry, yeah. Paul. Go ahead, man. Yeah, Go ahead. Yeah. yeah to, my knowledge, to my knowledge, I never ate a dog. But I, uh, you know, I just, I, I've really felt like, um, like, like animals just get the short end of the, uh, of the straw sometimes. And uh, very often, you know, if you look at how human beings treat animals, it's not that good. Now we do a lot of terrible things to them. And so uh, back in 1993, I saw a video about like what happens inside of slaughterhouses and in factory farms where the animals are kept in these tiny cages. And, you know, back then there was like no YouTube, no internet. It was like a VHS tape inside of a VCR. And for those of you who are too young to know what that is, it's like a big rectangular piece of plastic and it's kind of like YouTube in a, in a big box. All right. And uh, so my friend showed it to me and I was really horrified. I thought like, man, what, what would I do if those are my dogs? And like, if those are my dogs in that tiny cage where they can't even turn around their whole lives, or if they were hanging upside down, I would throw it slightly. You know, I was like, I don't want anything to do with this. And so I thought, you know, it's one thing to eat animals if we have to, to survive. If it's a matter of survival, you're going to die if you don't do it. It's another thing if it's not a matter of survival, if we're doing it just because, you know, we want to or because we like it. And so I thought, you know, if I can just live and let live, and uh, not eat meat, then I would do that. And so I became a vegan pretty rapidly. Um, actually, I, came a, I became a vegetarian first, and I had never heard of vegan, but then um, I started reading more, and I saw this interview. You guys remember Carl Lewis? Yes. yes. Remember Carl? Right. Um, so, like, 100 meter, 200 meter, yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was an amazing gold medalist Olympian. He was kind of like the Usain Bolt of that era, right? The best Olympian. He was like Correct. all-American. And interestingly, a little uh, fun fact for you about him. So you know him, Marlon, as 100 and 200 meter, which is what he's most well known for. But he actually has more gold medals in the long jump than in any of the sprints. Yes, I remember uh, he used to do the long jump. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, he's like an amazing athlete. I had a big poster of him on a wall. He was like my hero when I was a kid. And I read an interview with him in which he said that actually his best Olympic years were the years where once he became vegan. And I was like... You know, you're telling me that not only can you survive without eating animals, but that like the best athlete in the world is not only mm-hmm. vegan, but it attributed some of his success to that diet. And I was like, so then it became for me, it was like not just that I wanted to prevent cruelty to animals. It was also that my own hero, Carl Lewis, was out there like touting this. And so I became vegan back in 93. 
and it, it was just like a different world back then. You know, we didn't have what we have today. Yeah. Um, but as is and now, you got you know you got all the plant based meats. You know, you can still enjoy you know hamburgers and hot dogs and sausages and meatballs because right. they you know they're just made from plants and they're a lot healthier for you. So it's a lot easier now than then. But I would say like even then, it still wasn't that difficult. I mean, I still enjoyed eating bean and rice burritos and lentil soup and other things that are good. You know, it wasn't like I was like sitting there eating grass. Yeah. 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 It's not like I was eating like grass, you know, I mean, it was fine. It was fine. <laughs> I think yeah. some, some, sometimes I talk to people who've been vegan for a long time like that and they they make it seem like, Oh man, back in the day, it was like the world was black and white and I had to walk uphill both ways in the snow to go get my tofu. And like, I don't remember it that way. I, I just remember like enjoying bean and rice burritos a lot. That was really like yeah, yeah, my, yeah. My, my, my man memory back then. Oh, uh, but yeah. It was, uh, yeah, but it's a lot easier now. And to answer your question about what sustained me, I mean, well, first of all, it's a real desire to protect animals. Like I really feel like we shouldn't be committing violence against them. So that's one. But also, uh, I've been very fortunate, and I met a lot of great people who are part of my social circle, including my wife, who is a vegan cookbook author. And mm. so, you know, when you're married to a vegan cookbook author, it's not that hard to be vegan, I tell you. Yes, yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. So, so, I mean, with that story, and you can give us a little bit more de detail on this part, you, in back in the 90s, I mean, I can assume you were, what, teenager? Uh, you had a yeah. poster on the wall. So, I mean, adults typically don't have folks yeah. on their, <laughs> their wall. Yeah, unless, there, unless there, you're in that movie with the trainer on your over your mantle, right? Forget that movie. No. <laughs> I, I, I had a lot of posters back then. One of my favorite ones, uh, this is unrelated to anything, so that's what I want to bring it up to you. So, first of all, I was 13 years old at the time. Okay. But, uh, so, at that time, I was living in the D.C. area, and then, now they're called the Wizards. Back then, they were the Bullets. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so they had, you remember, they had both Manute Bowl and Muggsy Boogs on the yes. team. At, yes. at that time, there was the tallest and the shortest player in the NBA. Right. They had a, a life-size poster of these two guys. One of them's like one of them's like five six, and the other's like seven seven. And it has this <laughs> life-size poster of the two of them. It was really funny. And Muggsy Boogs comes up to Manute's like waist or something. It's really yeah, funny. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy, yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. so with that, you know, thirteen years old, making this this life changing decision you know at that time you weren't necessarily providing or were you i mean you're probably cooking for yourself if you know you want to be a vegan but you know how, how are you getting this food and the how to convince your parents like hey you know i'm i'm going to be I'm a vegetarian i'm not eating that anymore you know yeah Oh, yeah. When I told my parents I want to be a vegetarian, they didn't have any problem. Like they knew of vegetarians. Like I remember them even saying, oh, yeah, I think Einstein was a vegetarian. So they didn't have a problem with that. But when I told them I wanted to become vegan, they did get very nervous. They're like, you know, yo, is this like going to be some uh, new nutritional problem? I mean, they were really concerned. And so uh, they wanted me to go see a nutritionist. And at that time, I was like, what is a nutritionist? I didn't even know what it was, but yeah. uh, they wanted me to go see a nutritionist to make sure that this was fine. And you know, there's no internet again, so it's not like you can look this up. And so they pull out the yellow pages, which for again for younger viewers is a uh, you know like Google and a big big <laughs> big book. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and uh, they pull out the yellow pages and they just picked somebody who was like, close to us geographically. And we went to her, and I'm not kidding. Like by the grace of God, this woman was a vegan. And you think about like how rare that would be, like, you know, you, somebody back then. Mm. And so I went to this nutritionist and she was vegan. And so that helped my parents to, I just got so lucky then, but that helped my parents to, uh, I'd say, be a little bit less concerned. And now uh, my parents are, uh, I would say, pretty much like 90% vegan right now. Uh, so oh. they're, you know, they're, they're, they're going strong in their 70s and uh, they exercise a lot and they enjoy a ton of vegan food. I'd say nearly everything that you eat is vegan. So um wow. so you know it's it's been a good it's been a good ride oh yeah yeah they better be they have a son that's a can supply them with with, with some food. Yeah, that's right <laughs> yeah they, yeah they need they need to support our they need to support the better me because so they gotta be on it they gotta be on it <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm telling you man i remember i remember when i first learned about morning star and oh, yeah I'll, I was eating that Morning Star burgers, man. I used to love it. The Boca Burger came in, and then mm -hmm. yeah. you know, after a while, we started to and I, and I, well, we never tried to get an endorsement them for, from them, Ricky. So I don't know if they're gonna say they'll never give us after this. But you know, um, those Morning Star burgers and all those—they were high in sodium and 
real. They weren't they weren't the best for you, and they weren't even hundred percent vegan because you checked in the back. They had egg whites and all this Some different of, stuff. Yeah. Some and of we did, had yeah. To, yeah, and then we had to try to veer off to see where we were gonna go, where I was gonna go, and um, tofu was the thing. Um, I'm looking at your website. And when Ricky and I, Ricky and I actually, Ricky, I was on the phone with Ricky, Ricky showed his wife and he was like, babe, look at this, look at this me here. She was like, oh yeah, yeah. He's like, it's not me. (laughs) (laughs) So tell us about, tell us about that. I'd love to hear about um, the, the fermentation and all the different ways that you, you brought that together. And then after you, you explain that we're going to try to go on the entrepreneur side because I know there's an other side to this whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. So, all right, put it this way, guys. So think about like you have the meat experience that people have now, which is basically you slaughter an animal and you take the meat from their body. So there's other ways to replicate that. And one of them would be instead of raising whole animals and slaughtering them, you can take microscopic animal cells and grow the actual animal cells up into real animal meat. That's not a meat alternative or meat substitute. It's real meat grown from animal cells that just didn't involve slaughter. So that's sort of the topic of my book is, which is called Clean Meat. And I write about the entrepreneurs, the investors, the scientists who are all racing to bring the world's first slaughter-free meat to market. Then you say that's what's called cultivated meat from animal cells or cultivating animal cells. Then if you're not going to go to the animal kingdom, you can go all the way over to the plant kingdom. And in the plant kingdom, you can use soybeans, you can use peas, you can use wheat, you can use chickpeas. There's a lot of different ways to make a meat experience where it really tastes similar to animal meat, but it's coming from animals. The, excuse me, but it's coming not from animals, but from plants. So then yeah. you have, uh, but you have to do a lot to the peas or the soybeans to get them into something that looks like animal meat. You have to fractionate them, which means you remove the fiber, you remove the fat. Um, so you get a protein powder. And then you take that powder and you subject it to something called extrusion, which is just a fancy way of saying lots of heat and lots of pressure. And on the other end, you get something that's kind of a stringy type protein like animal meat. So you got to do a lot, though, to get a plant to taste like an animal. However, there's another kingdom. There's not just animals and there's not just plants. There's also fungi. Fungi are a completely different kingdom. They're not plants. They're not animals. They're a completely different kingdom altogether. And what we at the Better Meat Code do is run a microbial fermentation where we take microscopic fungi and we subject them to a fermentation where we are feeding them things like potatoes and corn. And within hours, they convert it into something that looks like animal meat. So think about it like this. A cow eats grass and converts that grass into something that looks like a steak, except it takes over a year of feeding that cow before you slaughter the cow and get that steak. Our little tiny microscopic fungi eat starchy foods like potatoes and corn and convert it into something that looks like a steak, except instead of a year or more like a cow, we do it within hours. And so we run a fermentation facility here in Sacramento, California, where we are running a fermentation that within hours is converting things like potatoes and corn into something that really looks like meat and tastes like meat in a very, very short amount of time without harming animals and with a tiny fraction of the land and water and greenhouse gas emissions that are needed to raise and slaughter animals for food. Wow. Wow, yeah. that's that's amazing. Is that similar to the same process as tempeh? Um, actually, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that. So it's a different type of fermentation, but yes, tempeh is a fermented food. So uh, with tempeh, what you do is you take one type of fungi, it's called rhizopus, and you let it partially consume. So let, let's just go back. So for people who are not familiar with fermentation, think about, you know, in fermentation, the most commonly known food of fermented uh, food is beer, right? So, or wine or alcohol. So you know, what's happening is you're taking microscopic organisms, in that case, a brewer's yeast, and you're feeding it sugar and it converts that sugar into the, that's the fermentation process. It converts the sugar in this case into alcohol. Or let's say you take baker's yeast, which is a different species, and you feed it sugar and it produces CO2 so that your bread rises. Like the reason your bread needs yeast to rise is because the microorganism eats the sugar and then it causes a a leavening through the CO2. So you have these organisms, these microorganisms that create different things. One case, alcohol, another case, CO2. Um, And in the case of tempeh, what you're doing is you're taking a particular type of species, a different organism, feeding it soybeans and creating a cake that is a high protein, nutritious cake that we call tempeh. It's a traditional Indonesian food. What we are doing is using a different organism altogether. 
It's not mm. a brewer's yeast or a baker's yeast or a rhizopus like they use um, for tempeh. This is a different organism that we have found that just really makes a meat-like experience. Mm -hmm. So like in the same way, there's thousands of plants out there, right? Again, there's soybeans, there's wheat, there's pea, there's chickpea. There's thousands of species of animal that produce different types of meat from chickens to pigs to cows and fish. Well, we are using in the microbial kingdom, there's thousands of species, and we have found one that really, really produces something that looks and tastes like meat. And so we subjected to this fermentation to help it grow and grow fast. And we believe that this could be the future of food, that this really could be a way to satiate humanity's meat tooth, so to speak, without the need to raise animals. So you can prevent a lot of animal suffering, and you could free up a lot of land, a lot of water and emit fewer greenhouse gas emissions and have a more sustainable future where we can feed humanity without destroying ourselves and the planet in the process. So Man, I don't, Rick, I don't know how, this is, this is like, right? And, and yeah. Ricky's an engineer, so you guys are probably gonna connect when it comes there. Uh, I, I, I like the sciences too, but I'm, I'm just thinking like, Rick, we definitely gotta go to Sacramento. I don't know if the, you said the, and we definitely have to come down there and walk the grounds because that right. is fast. What you're saying right now is just fascinating to me that you're able to take this fungi and then just grow, grow yeah. meat. Yeah, yeah, it seems like magic. I'll tell you, it seems like magic, but it's not magic. It's just science. And yeah. it's a really an amazing science, but it's an all natural process. And the material that we're growing, which we call rhizomycoprotein, that mycoprotein on its own is higher in protein than eggs. Wow. It's higher in higher in iron than beef. It's higher mm -hmm. in fiber, higher in fiber than oats, higher in potassium than bananas. It naturally contains vitamin B12, which is lacking in plant foods typically. And yep. it is a real <laughs> superfood that not only is nutritious, but it tastes like meat. And so why wow. not? Why not do this? Like I, my my feeling is this. Most people are not, you know, like actually go back to the light example. So you go in a room, you flick on a light switch. What you want is an illuminated room, right? You're not sitting there thinking, is this coming from coal or oil or is it coming from wind or solar? You just want light and that's it. You're not thinking about anything else. The same is so when people eat meat. When people eat meat, they're not thinking, ah, I'm so glad an animal was slaughtered for this. In fact, if they think about it, oh, they might prefer that an animal not be slaughtered for it. Uh, yeah. And so if we can recreate that meat experience, I think lots of people will be quite pleased to eat something that really looks and tastes like meat, but didn't involve an animal at all. You've been listening to the Success Journey Show. You can check us out on our social media on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Also on our website, thesuccessjourneyshow.com. Enjoy the rest of the show. So, Paul, there's one critical element of this story before we go further into the, the just the whole business side of what we're what you're doing here. Um, I know you didn't just get a kit off of Amazon and say, hey, I'm about to start experimenting. <laughs> Different type of stuff. But like, tell us a little bit about your educational background uh, and research in order to gain the knowledge that you have now to kind of explore some of this. Oh, sure. So, you know, first, let me be clear. I'm the face of our company. I'm not the brain of our company. All right. Like, you know, Ricky, you're an engineer. We got engineers here. So I'm not one of the engineers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I would say like this company has been, so I, I founded it uh, three and a half years ago and we have been building and researching for that whole time to try to figure out like, what's the best thing that we can do. We've screened hundreds of strains of species uh, of, of uh, species of fungi to be able to see what works the best, to see what grows the fastest, what is the most meat-like texture, what is uh, accumulates the most protein during fermentation and more. We've tried out lots of different fermenter designs. It turns out like the fermenter is basically like a farm. You know, the little microscopic fungi, that's like your animals and the fermenter is a farm. And the size and the shape of the farm actually makes a difference to how the animals, so to speak, grow in there. And so we've tried lots of things like that. And eventually we've settled on certain um, uh, designs and conditions that create really good conditions for growing our particular species of fungi. So we've been really pioneering this uh, from the beginning and trying to figure out what are the ways to optimize this process. Because if you think about it, like, you know, let's say you were gonna do, let's say you're gonna create like Ricky and Marlin's egg farm. 
you would then go out and get strains of chickens who have been bred for centuries to lay a lot of eggs. So the current strains of egg laying chickens lay about 300 eggs per year. However, right. let's say let's say instead of using a modern strain of laying chicken, you instead got a chicken from 5,000 years ago who only laid 20 eggs per year. Like you're going to have your farm and you can have the chicken laying 300 eggs or 20 eggs. And that is the difference between what we are doing. Like we're using the, the 5,000 year old chicken here. Like there's no optimization of our process yeah. yet. And so what we need to do is uh, basically work to continually uh, create conditions that lead to 300 eggs per year to continue with that analogy. And it's not easy to do. Uh, you know, we're, we're pioneering ground here where you're essentially using like wild harvested species of fungi that have not been optimized to be farmed in the way that we are farming them. And right. so we're, we're conducting like a controlled indoor agriculture experiment with this organism to see how we can get it to grow in ways that we want it to grow. Uh, so that is the type of uh, R&D that needs to be done. We've come a long way, but yeah. we, still have a long way, we still have a long way to go. What type of an engineer are you, Ricky? Uh, trained mechanical engineer. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, well, that's cool. Uh, well, the you know the type of engineers that work here generally, uh, we often have people who like have been in the brewery world. Like that's a the chemical. most yeah the most cynical excuse me the most similar thing to what we're doing here is like beer brewing, yeah. um, except uh, so it looks like a beer brewery except. It's not a, you know, we're not making beer, we're making meat. Uh, actually, though, uh, did you guys ever see um, Contact with Jodie Foster? Remember that movie where the aliens contact us? No? All right, well, you haven't seen it, but for any of your listeners who have, I kind of think that the machine that are, that we have built, the fermenter that we built, looks like the machine in the movie that they build with the alien blueprint. So go and watch Contact and you can see. But if you want to see what our facility looks like, it looks a little bit like that. I'm going to that Contact. <laughs> yeah. Oh it's, oh, it's a great movie. Oh, I, I highly recommend the movie. It's really, really good. It's about a it's about a um, a alien civilization that contacts us and gives us a blueprint on how to create a machine. And we don't know what the machine is for until we turn it on. I won't I won't give you the rest. Uh, yeah, you, you see you see see what happens. Definitely. Yeah, I gotta check that out. Yeah, I, I've got to check that out. Um, I'm I'm gonna tell you, man. It's it's really fascinating. So. Did you learn about the fung and then form the company, or how did the, how did the whole company, the formulation yeah. of the company, work with, with with the knowledge and also the business side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I knew that I needed to bring on people who knew more about um, both mycology and fermentation than I did. I, I knew that there was something that we could do here because uh, there is publicly available literature on the fermentation of fungi, and some fungi are quite meat-like in their texture. Uh, so, you know, for a long time, mushrooms were used as meat substitutes, especially in ancient China. So, mm -hmm. you know, in ancient China, they've been using mushrooms as a meat substitute for centuries. So, yeah. you know, the question, but mushrooms don't grow that fast, and they're not that high in protein. So how can you create something that's meat-like that actually grows much faster and accumulates a lot more protein? That's that's what we need to figure out. So I, I started out to find people who would come join this company uh, back in early 2018 and uh, wanted to find people, frankly, who knew a lot more than I did. And so while I would raise the money for the company and I would be our face and I would work with customers and so on, um, I knew we needed scientists uh, who would understand how to actually create these products. And so even today, uh, we're, you know, we're three and a half years old. We have only 16 employees. We're still a small team. But most of the people who work here are scientists. And, uh, I, you know, I, we don't have any salespeople. We don't have any marketing people. I do all that myself. And mm -hmm. so that's really like my role is not only helping to raise money from investors, but also uh, working with our customers to ensure that they're getting what they need. And then letting our scientific team work to create the best products that we can make. Wow. Wow. Man, that's, that's, that's very, very important. You said a lot of key things in just summarizing that because one is, and we, and Marla and I, we kind of, we mentioned this quite a few times on the show is you don't have to know it all. Right. Um, and you got to know what you don't know and bring people in that, that know what you don't know. Um, and that's how you form a great team. You know, you had some people that Paul, you could have been like, well, you know what? I, I need to spend some time learning about 
uh, more about fungi, you know, and, and the fermentation. <laughs> and I'll, I'll go to school, I'll go back to school and study it, right? And I'll, I'll get my own lab and I'll do my own test and everything and I'll, I'll do this. But you're like, nah, uh, I'm going to find people that have already spent all that time learning it, becoming an expert at it. And I'm going to let them see the vision that I have and I have them believe in that vision. And then we come together and now form something that can go a lot further because now I'm staying in my skill set. I'm staying in my lane. They're staying in their lane. We're working all around the same vision, the same goal. And now three and a half years later, you say that's not a long time. That's not, you know, still small, but that's three and a half years, even through the last two years, which has been COVID, right? So, I mean, that's that, that says a lot about your team to be able to, to sustain and continue moving and building over this time. So uh, travelers, I, I hope you got a, a chance to really hear that in, in his explanation of like, hey, I, Paul didn't say I got to put it all on my shoulders and go out there and, and, and know everything. But he did say, hey, let me find the people that do know it. And that's, that's, I mean, that's the first step of entrepreneurship, right? I, I, many people get scared to go out and do things because they don't have the, the skill set. They feel they don't have the skill set or the knowledge base. Now I would ask you this, Paul, now, you know, people with that skill set, and if it's too much information, I mean, you can't share that and you know, let us know, but you know, people of that skill set and of that caliber also come with a price. You know, and, yeah. you know, when you build a team at this capacity, you know, you also said another thing about, you know, raising money. So talk, talk to our travelers about, you know, when you saw that, say, hey, I need to raise, I need to bring people on board. It's going to cost, you know, I don't know what that's going to cost, whether it's equity, whether it's uh, actual pay or whatever it may be um, versus, hey, I need to make, raise money. How do I raise money on a product that I don't have yet? How do I convince investors that this is something that they need to invest in? Talk about what was going on in your head, getting all that stuff together as you were building this. Yeah. So before I answer your question, which I will, Ricky, I just want to affirm what you were just saying, because that's exactly what I view entrepreneurship as. You don't need to do everything. You don't need to know everything, but you need to bring the right people in around you who do. It's a team. You know, look, you may be Michael Jordan, but you still need Scottie Pippen on there. You still need John Sally on there. Like you are not going to run the team yourself. You don't yeah. need to be able to play every position. You need to be able to lead a team you need to be able to have the vision and you need to be able to show that you're in the trenches as well, but you don't need to be able to do everything. So I am, you know, I'm completely in concert with what you're saying, Ricky. Now, uh, the second part is like a, a more logistical question, because how are you going to get people who have a lot of expertise to come work for an unproven startup that has, you know, nearly no money and, and nearly nothing to its name? And the short answer you alluded to it, Ricky, is, you know, one, you want people who really believe in the vision and the mission. You know, they may even want the type of people who enjoy building. There's some people who want to be safe. They want to stay at a big company where they have, you know, the, the reliable uh, pay and they have, you know, this is their, what they're going to do the rest of their life. But there's a lot of people who enjoy the excitement of trying to build something from nothing. And so they may make less cash payment doing this, at least at first, while the company is still underfunded. But it's made up for with equity in the company. So all of our full-time employees are owners of the company. They get, they, get, mm -hmm. they, get, they get stock options in the company such that if there's a big liquidation event like an IPO or the company gets acquired, they're going to make way more money than they would have in their salary. So, yeah. uh, you know, and then the question is, do you believe? Like if the company fails, that stock is worth nothing. But if you believe that the company is promising, you should do it in a heartbeat because you would say These st this stock is going to be great. I mean, look at how many, like, I mean, obviously companies like Facebook and Google are the, are, are extreme exceptions, yeah, um, but yeah, but the, or the early employees there, uh, you know, are all multimillionaires. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, there's a story actually about a, a muralist. This guy was a graffiti artist and he was offered uh, when Facebook started out, they said, Hey, uh, would you be willing to come paint some murals in our new office? And the guy said, yeah, I'd love to. And they said, okay, well, we'll pay you $60,000 for all these murals or you can get some equity in the company. And he chose the equity rather than the murals. And that dude, when they IPO had made over $200 million, $200 million. <laughs> and, and so, you know, like if you really believe in the company, if you think, Hey, this is actually promising, that's incentive enough. Um, but it, it, you know, look, lots of companies fail. So you're taking a risk. Um, yeah. But there, there's a, there's a trade-off between salary and equity. And, you know, some people, 
care more about the salary because it's guaranteed money to them now. Other people may want more equity because it's a bigger payoff later. So that's the yeah. that's what you case so we got to talk to people about. But most importantly, you want people who are aligned with the mission, who are willing to work in, in pretty suboptimal conditions. You know, when you're starting out, you don't have the proper resources. You know, you don't have all of the amenities that big companies have. Um, yeah. We're starting to get there. We're starting to improve, like you know, on on certain things. Uh, but it, you know, it, it takes time. Yeah. 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 Hey. Uh, so tell me something about business that. You know, when everybody's going to jump uh, before entrepreneur wasn't cool, but before back in the 1993, when you said you're an entrepreneur, somebody says, oh, you mean you're between jobs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. That's so yeah. funny. Oh, man, but, that's really good. <laughs> but as, as, as time went on, that was the wave and everybody was just happy to be an entrepreneur. Tell, tell the listeners something about entrepreneurship that really smacked you in the face and, and you said, oh, okay, that's going to, yeah. I got to, I, I got to learn that real quick. Um, what, what was something yeah. for you? Yeah, sure. So uh, first I'm going to answer your question, Marlon, but I do want to say, you know, I used to feel that way until a few years ago, what you just said about influencers. So people would be like, oh, I'm an influencer. I'd be like, well, that means you have no job. But now I realize it's actually <laughs> can be a quite, can be actually a quite lucrative job. So quite yeah. the opposite. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I had my uh, my education on that for sure. Um, but what I've learned among many things about entrepreneurship is that you have to have a uh, no drama mentality if you can. In other words, you want to be like cool when you're up, cool when you're down, because you're going to be down more than you are up. Like there's just problem after problem after problem. And, uh, you know, when Obama was in the White House, people used to say like, oh, this dude is so stoic, right? He's like, he doesn't celebrate. I mean, it kind of reminded me of, um, of uh, you remember Jimmy Brown, the running back on the Browns? And yes. like, and so, you know, th- he would, he got asked one time by a journalist, he's like, you know, why don't you ever dance in the end zone? Like everybody else makes scores such ends. They're like, you know, doing all these dances. Like, oh, you know, I don't, don't want to seem like I've never been there. And <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and then the question is like, do you get upset when you, when you have hardship? And I really believe that one of the keys is to remain cool when you're up and cool when you're down. Cause there's so many problems, so many challenges, so many obstacles. And I'm constantly reminded of the, uh, the quote from the great philosopher, uh, Rocky Balboa, when he, <laughs> said, <laughs> when he said that, you know, in life, it's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. And that's what entrepreneurship is like to me. Like you just get hit all the time. Bad news occurs all the time. Things yeah. don't work. Um, you know, it takes more money than you thought you would need. You need more time than you thought you would need. People who you really rely on end up leaving. Like there's just a, a multitude of problems that can go wrong. Yeah. And and you just have to be able to have resilience. Like tenacity and resilience to me seem far more important than almost anything else because you will struggle and the temptation to quit is going to be sometimes more than you would like to admit. But if you really believe in the mission of your company, if you really believe that you're doing something good for the world, it's worth it. Yeah, that's, yeah, you said a lot there, Paul, you know, and as you were saying that I, you know, reflecting on so many different journeys of and conversations with individuals that, you know, sometimes get discouraged on this journey, uh, whether due to entrepreneurship or whatever it may be, mainly entrepreneurship. And it's just realized that sometimes, you know, entrepreneurship is an island, you know, you're, 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 you don't have a whole bunch of cheerleaders, you know, behind you. You don't have a a a board saying, "Hey, you're the or a parking spot to say best employee of the month." You know, you don't have you don't have, you don't you don't have that, right? You know, you have the dream and you have you know a team that you build around you. But you know, especially as an owner and a founder of this thing, you know, sometimes many lonely nights of just wonder, like all right, I have this dream. Like, how do I, what's the next move? Like I, tomorrow I'm just praying that something happens, something opens up so that I can, you know, right. just, just have that, this little bit more faith, just to keep moving and a little bit more steam just to keep moving. And uh, I'm so glad you shared that. Now I would, I would ask you this, is this your first entrepreneurial venture? Yeah. So uh, first, you know, to what you're saying there, uh, Ben Horowitz has is, is written some great books on entrepreneurship. He has a great line where he says that starting your own company will make you sleep like a baby because you're going to wake up every two hours and cry. And, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I, yeah, I, understand, I understand that. 
um, because you have a, a huge weight on your shoulder. Uh, you know, it's like the head with the crown is always the heaviest. And mm. you, you, you really have, especially if your company starts growing, you have all these people depending on you. Um, you know, we, you know, if you start looking like you might actually run out of money, you realize like all these people who are depending on you are really at risk. It's not just your mission and, and the vision that you have that will go unrealized. It's also these people who you really care a lot about are going to suffer as a result. And so, uh, it is a lot of pressure. Um, it, it really is. Uh, but to answer your question directly, Ricky, you no, know, uh, I never started a company, but I, I did write a book about entrepreneurs and about um, uh, the entrepreneurial race to bring slaughter-free meat to the market. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, in writing the book, Clean Meat, it became very clear to me that many of the people who are running companies in this particular industry, at least, uh, are not people who have extensive experience. They are not people who have MBAs. They're not people who have PhDs. They're not people who have run big companies. A lot of them are doing it because they have passion, because they have a desire. They have like an indomitable will to move forward. And so I'll give you just one example that I tell in the book where there's two guys, um, Paramal Gandhi and Ryan Pandya. And they were in their early 20s, back in 2014. And they met by video chat. They never even met in person. They just met on video chat. And they started talking about an idea. They wanted to use fermentation to make real dairy without cows. So not like soy milk or oat milk, but like actual real cow's milk, but without cows. And they thought that they could make it work. And so they decided to start their own startup together. And they raised a little bit of money. They eventually met in person. They raised a little bit of money. And now, seven years later, they are running this company that they founded, <laughs> These guys are still in their 20s today, seven years later, still in their 20s. Wow. And um, according to an article in the Wall Street Journal that I just read, uh, their company is now worth $1.5 billion. $1.5 billion. And so, you know, you think about that, like these guys didn't have any experience. They were in their early 20s. They had no experience doing anything almost. You know, they were just out of school. And now they're really like captains of industry doing some really amazing things. They've raised hundreds of millions of dollars in venture capital. Their company is apparently worth 1.5 billion. Um, and so telling those type of stories in the book, Lean to Me, helped me to realize like, hey, listen, if these guys can do it, why not me? Why yeah, not? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And it takes so, a special, go ahead. So often the barriers that hold us back are self-imposed. They're in our own minds. Like we think yeah. that we can't do something like, and so we don't do it. And yeah. it's, we can't shackle ourselves like that. Like there are so many things that we can do if we simply have the will to keep on doing them. I'm not saying everything. It's not like pie in the sky. Like you can accomplish anything that you dream of. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that most of the time that we fail, it's because we have a poverty of ambition that we aren't looking further up enough. Ambition, probably, you know, like yeah, a poverty <laughs> of ambition. And I, I and the problems that we face right now on our planet are so great that we need people who are swinging for the fences. And that's what we're trying to do at the Better Miko is advance a type of science and technology that if it scales up, really could make a big dent in this problem. Mm. Yeah, I really like it. Now, I want to know... Um, distribution and, and stuff like that. Did you, do you have any stores locked up? Cause I know Whole Foods, man, I'm telling you, they, no, no, no. Um, what's the one that we go to Rick? Um, Wegmans. Wegmans. Wegmans have a very, they, they have a nice section when it comes to, um, anything vegetarian or vegan or gluten free, cool. all that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, distribution and where could people find your stuff if they, if they were looking for it? Sure. Oh, anyway, so uh, yeah, well, you can visit our website, which is bettermeat.co. However, we're an ingredients provider. So we are, you know, we don't have a brand that you're going to go see on a shelf. We are an ingredients provider of these uh, mycoproteins to other food companies for them to use in their products. And so, you know, you think about like all like take Beyond Meat as an example, right? Like they're buying pea protein on the market. Yeah, it's a great product. They use they buy, they buy pea protein on the market and then make it into their burger. Well, we're doing something similar as their pea protein provider, except instead of doing plant proteins, we're doing fungi proteins. And so we can sell to lots of different companies. So we sell to companies like Purdue Farms, to Hormel, and others who use our ingredients. And so uh, one of the most ubiquitous products that you can find of ours out there that contains our ingredients is Purdue. They have a product called Purdue Chicken Plus. And uh, that's available in Walmart and, and thousands of other supermarkets. And that includes plant proteins that the Better Meat Co. provides. Um, but 
uh, we're looking to build a huge fermenter. We want to build a fermenter the size of an office building so that we can have a river of our mycoproteins flowing through the food industry to help alleviate the need to raise so many animals for food. And so that's what we're really going for here now. Uh, now that we've built this facility in Sacramento that you guys are going to come visit us at, the next yes, one, yes. we want you to come visit and we're going to have a fermenter that's going to be gigantic and you're going to see a river flowing out of it that is like a river of meat and it will be beautiful. Oh, man, I love it. <laughs> yeah, love it. I love it. Man, I'm telling you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rick, I don't know. It, it, it's just so exciting because the science, the science side of it is captivating. Um, the fact that you, the way your journey to vegetarianism is um or vegan to be a vegan um is very exciting and then to top it off the cherry on top is that you took the, that love that passion and what we Ricky have on a shirt is what we um coin as the four D's yeah um, yep is dream drive discipline and diligence and what we I say see. is if you have those four things in any area of, of your life and you apply it that you can definitely come out a winner and we see like you applying four D's. And um, definitely, I, I, I love it. Um, I'm, 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 I'm sold on it already. Yeah, yeah. 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 You, <laughs> hey, you said it at the beginning of this uh, show. I don't know if we were recording or not, but um, you made a statement saying, hey, Marlon, by the end of this, we're going to convince Ricky to uh, get back on our side, you know? And uh, did, we, did, did we succeed, Ricky? Where are you at? Where are you at? I, I'm, more conv- I'm more convicted than we started. <laughs> all right, all right. Very good. Very good. Come on I mean, over, buddy. We're gonna, we're just gonna, you know, come on in the pool, man. It's nice. Dip a yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Come on in. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's, just, it, it's just, I mean, so many things, um, and so many benefits. I mean, I mean, I am not um, naive or uh, to the benefits of it, you know. And it's you, 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 you realize that you know your life and your body. You only have one. And how are you going to set yourself up so that you sustain it as long as you possibly can and sustain it in a way to where it's, you know, has the energy that you want can perform that you, you need, you need it. And like you said, you have all these athletes, you know, that are not just any common athlete, you know, the top of the echelon, you know, uh, testifying that, you know, their vegan diet has allowed, sustained their careers and allowed them to perform even better uh, at different uh, at points of their careers. And you can't, you can't negate that, you know, definitely can't negate, negate that at all. So I definitely will be, you know, reducing the, the animal-based pro, uh, protein I like, I mean, it's, you know, I, I tell you, <laughs> and when I see you in Sacramento, I, I hopefully I'll be like, you know what? I'm fully, I'm fully back on board. So yeah. Ricky, do me, Ricky, do me a favor. Email me your uh, snail mail. I'm going to send you one of my wife's uh, books. Okay. It's a great cookbook. You're going to love it. Okay, great, it. great, yeah. great. I'll, I'll shoot you. I'll shoot you. Yeah, her, yeah. yeah she, her, her, she has a number of cookbooks out there. The latest one is called The Friendly Vegan. Go to, uh, I'm going to get it. I'm going to send it to you. I think you're going to like it. Love hey, it. Love it. Yeah, I, Mark, definitely want, I definitely want you to do this now. Behind, well, I don't want to say behind. Beside every great person is somebody that's either sometimes greater, sometimes they're the driving force and they're the motivator that when you have those nights that every minute, every two hours, you're waking up like a baby, they, they mm-hmm. put you right back to bed, right? Oh, so yeah. hey, talk, about, talk about the wifey and, 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 and how she has been instrumental in your life. Uh, instrumental would be an understatement, Marlon. Uh, my wife, whose name is uh, Tony Okamoto, has been uh, an amazing ally for me in so many ways. And she is a rock on whom I depend. Uh, I joke that, you know, some people have like a saying to get themselves back in the game. Like if something goes wrong, they have something they say to themselves. You know what I do? I say, hey, Siri, call Tony. <laughs> that's it. That's what I say. <laughs> and so uh, she, she has been a, a wonderful source of support for me in so many ways during both the highs and the lows of my life and of our company here. And she's an entrepreneur herself. Um, she's doing a very different type of company, but she has uh, a company that started out just as a blog just a blog uh, uh, called plant based on a budget. And she grew it. She grew it just through revenue generation. No outside investment, didn't put any money of herself in. 
just through revenue generation and grew it to now where she has six employees and she's, mm-hmm. you know, going on to become like a best selling cookbook author through this. She has a huge audience online and uh, she's really created something through what, again, the brand is called plant based on a budget uh, that is really doing a lot of good and helping a lot of people who want to eat healthier for less money. And it's awesome. And so I'm really proud of her. Like I'm not only grateful to her for supporting me, but I'm really proud of her for what she has accomplished and the success that she's had. Because what I do with the Better Meat Co is we have investors and they're hoping to get a return on their investment at some point in the future. What she's doing is just making profit right now. You know, like she's not relying on outside investors. She just makes profit uh, and is able to hire all these people. So I'm really proud of her. And uh, I I think uh, just that (laughs) it's an amazing thing in today's era where so many people are dependent on venture capital to see somebody succeeding as an entrepreneur where they're just through bootstrapping alone or making it happen. Love it. 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 Paul, why don't you share that you, you mentioned a couple of names sporadically um, of your website, books and things of that nature, but take a moment right now just to list, you know, all the different things that you have, the different avenues people can reach out to you, um, the books that they can purchase from yourself, even, even your wife, um, that they can see, so that they can see, um, you know, just get more information. Why don't you share that? Yeah. Oh, uh, cool. It's very nice of you, Ricky. So uh, you can visit the Better Meat Co. at bettermeat.co. Again, that's bettermeat.co. If you're interested in my book, it's called Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner in the World. You can buy that anywhere books are sold on Amazon or anywhere else, uh, but it's also available at the book's official website, which is cleanmeat.com. Again, that's cleanmeat.com. And if you're interested in my wife, check her out. Uh, her books are on Amazon also. Her, her name is Tony Okamoto. And she's got great vegan cookbooks. Highly recommend that you check them out. I love her cooking, and I know you will too. Love it, love it. With travelers, man, we had uh, an amazing time with Paul. Paul, we thank you so much for joining us uh, today. And we know it's not going to be the last time that we're connecting. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, just tasting uh, the products in which um, have been produced with what you guys are producing there. And uh, guys, travelers, like this is another example of someone that has a dream, uh, drive, diligence, determination to make a better world for all of us. You know, it's just not about being a vegetarian or about vegan. And that's what I love about, about Paul's approach. He said, hey, what can I do to contribute to the world? What can I do to contribute to saving animals? Once we cleared up that he wasn't eating dogs, that, 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 <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but listen, this has been a great show and travelers, we will remember to go to our website, the success journey show.com. Uh, see all of our previous, uh, hosts. I mean, go ghost guests that we had. Don't ghost me after we're done. No, no don't do that. <laughs> uh, previous guests um learn a little bit more more about them through their bios and if you want to reach out to them their contact information is is there as well uh paul we want to thank you again for joining us and to all of our travelers around the world thank you and we'll see you guys again next week at the same time on the success journey show everyone have a good one bye all right ricky uh, ricky marlin 4d respect You've been listening to The Success Journey Show, where your dreams, drive, determination, and diligence are the foundation to success. For more information, check out thesuccessjourneyshow.com. The Journey Squad is here helping you to your destination.